What's up, everybody? It's Lee. Got a little bit of a different episode for you this week uh, off the beaten path. So Mike, Christy, and I could not get a time this week to record equally. Now, we do have several episodes planned for next week with actually some really uh, special guests coming up. So don't miss that. We're also going to be doing an episode on uh, what happens when you're moving up to the next age level, not the AAA level or anything else, but what just happens when you go from Mike to Squirt, Squirt to Pee Wee, so forth and so on. That's going to be a fun one. Um, but today I wanted to share something with you uh, I did in my earlier years of podcasting. And if you actually get a chance to watch this, you'll see I'm in a much older studio, dressed down with different equipment. Um, uh, I did this one three years ago, and I wanted to share it this week specifically because whether you know it or not, this is the actual uh, anniversary of the Miracle on Ice team. Um, now, I know many of you may have seen the movie Miracle, even watched the HBO documentary. Um, what I did here was an extreme deep dive into the preparation that this team did to, to not just win the gold medal in 1980, but to bond and come together to make that happen under Herb Brooks and all the players. Um, I really have studied this team in my life, uh, and not even just this team, actually, the Russians as well, the USSR as well. I find uh, Soviet hockey fascinating, and I read books about it. Not to geek out with you on that right now. But the point of this episode is that team really kickstarted my journey into coaching. Um, and it's funny, I had this conversation with my father recently about how most kids have NHL players on their wall, and I did too, but I also had uh, a poster of Herb Brooks on my wall as a kid, which probably wasn't normal, uh, especially going up in the in the 90s, right? I wanted to share this episode with you. It's a deep dive into the 1980 team and how, again, the preparation of six months going into it, the understanding of having to switch systems. You learn a lot about players, you learn a lot about coaches, you learn about, about how, how important team bonding is when you look at this team, and I really wanted to share it with you. So again, it's a deep dive episode. We don't talk about the, the deep tactics too often uh, on our Kids Play Hockey, but I think this is one everyone can enjoy. Um, and uh, apologies in advance when you listen to me. I'm probably talking a little bit too fast, a little bit unrefined at that time. It's still very listenable. Uh, it's just, it was funny when I was reviewing it today, kind of seeing uh, an earlier version of me on podcasting, uh, but uh, happy to share it with you. Uh, and as always, if you find value in this show, which we know you do, and you guys tell us that every week, please feel free to share it, share it in your team snap, share it with your friends, post it online, uh, give us those reviews. Uh, all of it really does help us out quite a bit. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to this intro. Without further ado, here's me with uh, how the 1980 team used team bonding to succeed. What's up, everybody? I'm Lee Elias. So I'm going to start this off with a story tonight because I can't believe it. Uh, I took my family out to a Chinese food dinner tonight, and I already knew what I was going to talk about when I was recording right here today. And I got my fortune here, and it says, if you can believe this, believe in miracles. Now, if you're looking at the jersey I'm wearing, and you know me, you know what I'm talking about already. But I thought that was incredible, because I am talking about no other team than the 1980 Olympic men's hockey team tonight. This is the first episode of Championship Traits, and the idea of this show, the whole purpose of the show, is to share great stories of the past and actually the present too, of teams that have overcome adversity, teams that have worked together, teams that had that bond necessary to overcome the odds and win. And my goal with this show is to inspire you or your teams or anybody that you're with to work together towards that common goal. Because I really do believe that we all want to be together and when groups work together, whether that's sports, business, family, doesn't matter, uh, miracles can happen and I'm going to start with this team because this is the team that really taught me the meaning of the word team bonding It's really the reason I got into team bonding and inspired me uh, the 40th anniversary is February 22nd 2020 that's the 40th anniversary of the miracle on ice and I wanted to dive into this team a little bit more than maybe some of the things You've heard or watched or or read uh, and tell you some of the things that I think contributed to because I don't think people fully understand the gravity of what this team was able to accomplish, not just in beating the Russians and winning the gold medal in 1980, but as a group together. So I got a bunch of notes here. I got a lot of things I want to go over. This isn't going to be too long, so stick with me because if you love anything sports related, this is going to be fun, especially if you love hockey. And uh, again, if you know a lot about this team, stay tuned because there's some stuff here that's going to surprise you. So uh, before we get going, quick source material look at. I have a few things. So a documentary, Who, Do You Believe in Miracles, on HBO was a great, big influence on me. Uh, ESPN has done documentaries. I've also read a lot. Uh, this book is kind of essential if you want to know anything about the 1980 Olympic team, The Boys of Winter by uh, Wayne Coffey. goes through every single player. goes through the entire tournament. 
Uh, it really gives insight into the minds of the players. I'm going to give you a little excerpt from this later. Uh, next up, The Making of a Miracle by Mike Urzioni. This just came out. Mike Urzioni, captain of the 1980 Olympic team. Uh, just a memoir of his life before, during, and after the Olympics. Uh, another great book. And also this book, uh, Herb Brooks, Inside the Mind of a Hockey Mastermind. Sorry, Inside the Story of a, a, a Hockey Mastermind by John Gilbert. Uh, the biography of Herb Brooks, the, the coach of the 1980 team. And his life, I, I always look for insight into this man because what he accomplished as a coach with this team was uncanny, unheard of, never happened before. Uh, in addition to that, I also have an article from uh, Chris Peters of ESPN that recently came out. So I, I really dived into this team. I've been studying this team for the better part of 20 years. Uh, let's just let's get into it. So little context, just in case you don't know, or you've been under a rock about this team. The setting is it's 1980. The Olympics are in Lake Placid, New York. Uh, the USSR is the greatest hockey team in the world. They had been for the last 30 years. They had won every Olympics from 1964 all the way up leading to 1980, every world championship. Um, in short, these were professional players under the guise of amateur status. They were in the uh, USSR military, the army, so they were able to pass as amateurs. Uh, team USA at this time, a bunch of college amateurs, uh, and sprinkled with a couple semi-pro guys who still had amateur status. Uh, but not a team you think would beat a team of professionals. USSR is beating NHL teams, except for the Philadelphia Flyers. That's another episode. Uh, but they're beating NHL all, all-star teams, NHL teams, beating everybody. Uh, you know, it's a David versus Goliath situation as you come into 1980. Uh, Goliath being the USSR, David being every other team in the field, including the USA. So when you look at teams, I believe in order to have a championship culture, a winning mentality, however you define the word winning, right? You need to have three things present. And you're going to hear this a lot on every episode. Talent, tactics, and a team bond, which is often overlooked and really is the most important part of the puzzle from where I sit. That's what I specialize in. So let's jump into quickly the tactics, I'm sorry, the talent of this team, okay? So here's a stat, and I love this stat, okay? Coming into 1980, again, these were college kids, uh, a lot of them hadn't played professional hockey, if at all. None of them had played in the NHL. But when we look back from today, from 2020, and you look back at their careers, the players on the 1980 Olympic team amassed 6,000 games in the NHL and over 3,500 points as a group. Okay, so what that means is these players, although somewhat unknown at the time, went on to have pretty amazing NHL careers. What that tells you is that in 1978, 79, uh, 1980, USA Hockey was really starting to surge with talent. It was really starting to come around. So, again, right timing and right people to be on that team. But as we enter the Olympics in 1980, nobody knows that. All right, Just time has told us that there was talent on this team. So the talent was present, okay? Maybe not as talented as the USSR at the time, but present enough that they could use it to their advantage. Again, we'll get to how they got the best out of that team in a little bit, okay? You move on to tactics, okay? When you look at the tactics of the 1980 team, you have to look uh, leading up to the tournament, the Olympic tournament, and then the game itself, the famed USSR Miracle on Ice, which a lot of people don't realize was not the gold medal game. That's not how the Olympics worked back then. Again, we'll get into that. So leading up to the tournament is a pretty amazing thing that happened with Herb Brooks. So Herb Brooks uh, put a rigorous six-month training camp uh, slash Olympic schedule together to get them up to the Olympic Games, okay? And uh, in order to compete with the USSR, he knew that his team needed to be the best conditioned team in the world. And he accomplished that through lots of drills, skating drills. He used to say, legs feed the wolf, right? If you've seen the movie Miracle, you've seen that quote, or it's, it's around, right? But he would put his team through a rigorous cardiovascular training, making sure that they had the endurance needed to survive a game with the USSR for the course of six months. So that's number one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, number two was he implemented a new system. So ice hockey systems are all over the place nowadays. There's lots of different ones. Back then, it's a pretty standard system in the U.S. is defenseman gets it to the winger, winger gets it to the center, and you leave the zone. Well, the Russians didn't play that way. The Russians had a weaving in and out motion where the puck carry would move up and find somebody else. They worked in groups of five. So Herb Brooks adapted that system to the team, Team USA, and had them learn it within six months. And in a lot of the reading, I find out that the players had no idea what they were doing in the beginning. They thought Herb Brooks was crazy, for lack of a better word. So he started implementing that tactic six months ahead of time. Um, also, the rigorous schedule. So six months leading up to the game is not a normal Olympic schedule. Most of the time, the teams today have maybe two to four weeks. So this was six months 
of games and practices and time together as a team. When we get to the team bonding section, I'll explain why that also impacted their ability to come together. But in a great excerpt from the Mikey Rizzioni book, um, I found out that Herb Brooks really had planned each one of these games purposely for a reason. So some of the games were physical, some of the games were fast, some of the games where they could work on their systems. Uh, but maybe the most notable game on the schedule, and I found this amazing, was the last game, which was against the Soviet Union, the A team, the team they were playing in the Olympics, two weeks prior to the Olympic Games. Again, in the movie Miracle, you saw this because Team USA got pumped 10 to 3. They got killed. Now, what I found out was that Herb Brooks expected them to lose that game. In fact, in fact, he wanted them to lose that game. He said, quote, this is where we get killed. This is where the Russians kill us, right? So he had planned for them to meet this team early, probably and very wisely to get out any kind of, oh my God, we're playing the Russians or any kind of fandom, all of that out the way. So they wouldn't be afraid at Lake Placid. Again, genius planning here, genius tactics by Herb Brooks. Now, when we look at the game itself, February 22nd, 1980, the miracle on ice. A lot of things happened out of the ordinary, okay? So, number one, they were playing unbelievably short shifts, Team USA. Sometimes 15 seconds in length. Now, in the movie, they depict this kind of towards the end of the game. From my reading, it was the entire game. Shifts were 30 seconds or down. It was very rare they would get more than that. So, that plays in the endurance factor, and that's unheard of. I've never played on a team or coached a team where every single shift was 30 seconds or less but it was necessary to defeat the Soviets. All right, they also used the Soviets game against them. We talked about this, how the Soviets played a weaving style. Well, so did Team USA. And what they did is, even though the Soviets had a majority of possession in the game, of over 75%, the Americans were able to kind of throw their game back at them and clog the zone when they were coming in. So in hockey terms, they weren't giving the Russians much time to think or make decisions when they had the puck. And it was a good strategy by the team to make sure that they were at least controlling some of the shots on, on net. Again, we'll get to that in a minute. They were extremely disciplined. All right, they also capitalized on their opportunities. Now, these are some numbers I got from a recent ESPN article that astonished me because it made the miracle on ice even more of a miracle on ice. Now, check this out, okay? First off, the Soviets had 20 scoring chances on 52 shots. What that means, the scoring chances, 20 of the shots they took had a danger of going in the net. Okay, we'll get to the brilliance of the USA goaltender in a minute. 20 scoring chances. Keep in mind, USA won the game 4-3. to three, So they converted 3 of 20 scoring chances. Team USA, who won by 4 goals, <coughs> had 7 scoring chances on 25 shots. They scored 4 goals on 7 scoring chances. Talk about capitalizing on your opportunities. How did they do that? We'll get to that in a minute. Now, Jim Craig, the goaltender for the United States had a, a 0.935 save percentage. How do I put this in context for you? That is an incredible number in the 80s where most save percentages were below 900. It's an incredible number by today's save, set save percentage numbers. It's Hall of Fame number if you have that in a career. He played out of his mind in this game. Now, a lot of people credit him with the win. Statistically, they're not wrong because he stopped probably more pucks than he'd ever seen in his life in this game. All right. Keep in mind, the Soviets had 74% of the scoring chances in this game. Talk about capitalizing on your opportunities, right? The game-winning goal by Captain Mikey Rizzioni. Famous, famous goal. It's probably the famous, famous goal in hockey. So here's something I found out about that. He scored the exact same goal two weeks prior or three weeks prior in that game where they got pumped by the Russians 10-3. to So he had essentially done a dress rehearsal for that goal. Even though it was a different goaltender in net, he had practiced that goal in the previous game. We talk about visualization. We talk about things. He kind of knew to make that move on the Russians. Again, didn't know that until I did some of the reading here. So when you look at this at the end of the day, essentially what you have here is Team USA played a perfect game against the Russians to win, right? Again, not win the gold medal, just win the game. We'll get to the gold medal in a minute, okay? Now, I believe that the hardest thing to do in sports is to play a full game, whether that's a 60-minute game, a nine-inning game, whatever, to play a full, focused game as a team for the entirety of the game. They accomplished that. How? That's what brings us to the team bond. Now, when you look at the team bond, and I've got notes on this, a lot of stuff happened. There's a lot of aspects dealing with identity, trust, belief in one another, focus, and leadership that allowed them to get to this part. Now, again... 
Tactics and talent are extremely important, and Team USA had them. But to do something as Herculean as beating the USSR, they needed something else. That's where the team bond takes place. Now let's look at that. Herb Brooks is the leader and the head coach of this team. Let's give you a little bit of identity here with Herb Brooks. This man was on the 1960 Olympic team, a team that also won gold, until the last day prior to before they went to the Olympics to win that medal. He was cut from the team and ended up not being one of the gold medalists. This left a massive scar on the man, gave him a massive passion and a massive hunger to win. Losing sucks, getting cut sucks, but it can really spawn you to do amazing things. And I think it gave him a razor sharp focus, not just to win the gold medal, but to be the person that he became to be. A harsh, harsh move getting cut the night before. In fact, uh, his father turned to him and said, as the 1960 team won the gold medal, I guess they cut the wrong person. That must have hurt. That must have hurt bad. Unfinished business. So when he was taking over Team USA, he knew that he had to change the way the team played and change the way the team looked, right? And the famous quote, I'm looking for the right players, not the best ones, right? So he understood. He had a clear vision and purpose of how he needed to move this team forward in, in order to beat the Russians and somehow got USA Hockey to buy into it. It was not a popular strategy at the time. Again, you look at the geopolitics politics of the 1980s in this time period, Soviet Union is not what we want to be in terms of the worldview. Hockey view is another story, right? He also knew he had to push this team to the limits. That's where that six-month kind of Olympic schedule came in. Six months together. Now, why, why is this important? It starts with trust, okay? Trust is the fundamental foundation point for any group, for any team. If trust doesn't exist, it's not going to work. Here's the funny part about this team. The players on this team, when they got together the first time, don't like each other. In fact, it wouldn't be unfair to say that they hated each other. If you look at USA Hockey at that time, collegiately, you had a lot of players from Minnesota, a lot of players from Boston and New England. They do not get along. In fact, Minnesota and Boston College had some nasty brawls and nasty fights throughout the season, including in the tournament finals uh, a few years prior to 1980. So there's a lot of bad blood between these players. That's number one, all right? It was so bad that these players were getting into fights at the Olympic Training Festival, which is like a tryout for the team. They were fighting there. So again, think about your biggest rival. These teams hated each other. So they're coming into the team with that hatred. Herb Brooks did a masterful job, as he said, quote, blurring the boundaries of our country. And what he did was he created a common enemy for them to hate. It wasn't just the Russians. It was him. And he said famously in the film and in the books, it's quoted, I'll be your coach. I won't be your friend. He was letting the team know right then and there, this is not going to be easy. And he allowed himself to become the enemy. I'm going to read you later in the episode a letter from Herb Brooks to the team because this was not something that was easy to him, but it was necessary, right? So he knew that in order to get these guys to trust each other, they would have to kind of hate him right? But also trust in his ideas and his strategies, which they did, right? So a masterful job of building trust. And over the six month period and the rigorous training, and of course that famous scene in the movie where he's making them skate and do the Herbies up and down the ice after a tie to Norway all night, just unbelievably physically demanding that, you know, they bonded together over their want and, and really desire and need to show him that they could do this. You also got to remember people at this time. This is 1980. Most of these kids were born in 1955 to 1960. They kind of had that post-World War II upbringing. Uh, many of these players, a lot of these players, lived in houses with a lot of people. They didn't have a lot. They had to work in the summertime. Mike Urzioni, the captain of the team, uh, quoted that he actually had to you know, paint bridges in the summertime. He had to do manual labor in the summertime. That's a lot of how these guys made money. So you're talking about a work, working class individual on this team. These are the types of players that are on this team. So they had that going for them also. Now, when you look at the next really big thing, the identity of the team, all right, aside from being Team USA, you have to look at USA uh, as a whole at this time, all right? The, the country is going through a crisis of confidence, all right? That's Jimmy Carter said that at the time, not to mention massive Cold War uh, you know, fears are raging around the country. There are U.S. hostages being held in the Middle East. Uh, it's not the best time in the country's history, okay? There are lines for gas. Right? People were just generally down. This team had to embody something better than that. It had to embody the America that people remembered 
and also the America that we were trying to get to. All right. So they had that identity working for them. Another thing was from a hockey standpoint, playing for Team USA might be the mecca for a lot of these players, especially in college. At this time period, the NHL is not interested in college players. They're mostly looking at Canadian players. Every once in a while, a college player would make it, but it's not like it is today where NCAA Division I athletes are, you know, a roadway to the NHL. This could be the final stop and was the final stop for some of the players on this team, even though most of them made it to the NHL. Now, another thing that this team had was a belief in each other while facing massive adversity. They believed they could win. Now, I think I've done a pretty good job of explaining how big of a Goliath the USSR was at this time, the Red Army hockey team, they're the best in the world. The team believed going into that game they could beat them. And there are quotes from Herb Brooks, from Mikey Rizzioni, from a lot of the players saying, I know we can win this game. I believe we can win this game. Someone's going to beat these guys. That belief system started six months prior. That was the vision of Herb Brooks, to build them to the point where they would believe it. It's one of those old sayings, if you don't believe you're going to win, you're not going to win. This team had to believe it. Another good example of this in sports is when Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson. He didn't go into the ring thinking, I'm going to get pumped by Mike Tyson. He said, I'm going to beat Mike Tyson. Team USA said, I'm going to beat the USSR. And they did. And you have to remember at this time, two weeks prior to the Olympics starting, they got pumped by that team. They got destroyed. They still believed they could win. In a system that's not like today's Olympics where there's a gold medal game and a bronze medal game. It's all based on points. So even after defeating the USSR, they didn't even know if they were going to win the gold medal. They had to win another game against Finland, which they did. All right. Uh, just to give you another idea of this team's belief system, they came from behind in every single Olympic game, all seven of them, I'm sorry, seven of them, except for one game. So they came from behind to win in six of the seven games they had to play to win the Olympic Games. You know, the, the, the next thing, in, in kind of the final theme from a team point of view is just focus. You know, in, in living in the present moment. And this is something that team did well. In sports, we call this being in the zone. Okay, the entire team was in the zone that night, a level of focus, a level of belief in each other, a level of trust, a level of accountability. Everything was firing on all cylinders because of the artful coaching and strategy of Herb Brooks, Craig Patrick and the rest of the staff. All of it led to this point and it pinnacled because they had an impenetrable team bond. I believe that that is the factor that made the miracle on ice happen tactics and talents come and they're very 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 prominent in most sports the team bond tends to be what's missing now when you take an adverse look at the soviets and i've watched documentaries about the soviet team and, and studied the soviet team they love their country even though they were living in unbelievably harsh conditions but when you look at the team in 1980 they've had 20 30 years of winning they hadn't lost games in a long time. They probably overlooked the Americans. The bond was not as strong with them as it was with Team USA. That is the defining factor. When you look at all the statistics, when you look at all the players, all the stats, they believed in each other. Now, how can you recreate that for yourself? It can be recreated. I've seen it. I believe in it. I want to finish this episode with uh, a letter. This is something, this is a little treasure from this book, the, the Boys of Winter. Herb Brooks wrote the team a letter after they had won the gold medal. And until I had read this, um, I did not fully understand the sacrifice that he had to make as the coach of this team. Okay, I'm just going to read you an expert. This is Herb Brooks. Personally, this year was not only my most enjoyable year in coaching, but also my toughest. Toughest because it involved making so many difficult decisions regarding the makeup of our final team. Because of that, and because I wanted to be as objective as possible, I stayed away from close personal connections with you. I did not want the USA hockey community to say that regionalism and or favoritism entered into my final decisions. This year was a challenge for all of us. A challenge to live and work as a unit. Play a positive game in a creative way. Make the most out of our dreams. You met those challenges and conquered them. This is the key part. If there was, en if there was any team I ever wanted to identify with on a personal basis, this was the team. Hopefully that day will come. 
Respectfully, Herb Brooks. This man created the team he always wanted to play on and made himself an enemy of it in order to get them to believe. It's incredible to me. It's incredible to me. Now, Herb Brooks passed away almost 20 years ago, the turn of the century, uh, in a tragic automobile accident. And it's funny to hear the players talk about him today because there was a method to his madness and the respect that they have for him today maybe something they couldn't see when they were young young adults back in 1980, really does transcend time. And I think that he did get his wish. I think he did finally have them understand what he was doing and how he wanted to be part of that team. It's an amazing accomplishment, not just for Team USA, you know, not just for the country at the time, but in sports in general. And it taught me the meaning of team bonding and how important it was. There are people that say this team got lucky. There are people that say that it was just in any given Sunday situation. It wasn't. They planned this. Herb Brooks planned this. The team committed to it. Their work ethic wouldn't allow them to quit. They weren't soft about it, even though they faced massive adversity on the ice, off the ice, with each other. They found a way through it together. We need more of this today. Together. Pushing forward, finding the team bonds, and accomplishing goals together. What I want you to take away from this episode is what I took away from this team. And that's just light the flame. Understand that this stuff is possible. It's not limited to the 1980 men's Olympic hockey team. They just made me believe that we can apply this to anything. And I believe that you can and we can together. No matter what's happening out there, know that a team's working together towards a common goal, which is possible no matter how meek or horrible you think your situation is can accomplish unbelievable things together hey everybody hope you really enjoyed that again i really enjoyed making that a few years ago maybe i'll do a redux of this uh in a couple years time when it gets the 45th anniversary and i've I've read a lot more i actually know a lot more about the other side um of the ussr and, and the team bonding believe it or not that they did to become the best hockey team in the world for that 20, 30 year period. Um, It's fascinating. And again, I'll share that with you in the future. Again, if you enjoy this, please uh, share it. Give us a review. Email us at team at ourkidsplayhockey.com or visit ourkidsplayhockey.com to see every episode we've ever done. Uh, And remember, check out that website. We've got deals there for coaches, players, parents, um, year round now, uh, just ways to help you out in your journey in the game. So uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I don't have any co-hosts today. I'm Lee Elias. We'll see you on the next episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Have a great week, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.